Well, good morning. Hope you're all well. Um, certainly, uh, autumn is here, cold this morning. So hopefully, you're all uh, ready and uh, prepared to listen to me now for the uh, next sort of 45 minutes uh, to an hour. Um, we're going to be covering quite a lot of information on this, and I'm, I'm always mindful that it can sometimes come across as quite a lot. But hopefully, you'll uh, you'll be able to stick with me on this and uh, understand what I'm trying to get through to you. Uh, mutes are, a, you know, it's a fairly big old subject. I, I appreciate it's probably one of your only responsibility. Not sorry, not one of your only responsibilities. Um, and you've got many more things to, uh, you know, to to take into account. So uh, you know, with your daily duties. So um, without much further ado, uh, good morning to you all. Um, most importantly, thank you for attending the webinar this morning. Um, this webinar is Mutes Back to Basics. My name is Brian Parker. Uh, I'm uh, one of our business development managers. I'm on the technical support side of the company. Um, so not only do I support our field sales team and our training team, etc., but I also um, support our, our clients and customers uh, and, and, and look after your needs as well. Um, if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask them during the webinar. Um, what you, you know, once you've typed out your question, I see it in a little box, and uh, I'll endeavor to try and answer as many as I can during the webinar at the end, um, but of course those that I can't answer, um, I'll I'll um, I'll endeavour to answer after the actual webinar. So right, let's get started. Okay, so just a little bit on myself, very very quickly. Um, not going to bang on too much about sort of education and training. I've been in this game long enough. Um, really, sort of more interested in telling you that you know I'm very very much a uh, um, focused on IPATH, International, um, International Powered Access Federation, so I'm very much involved with, um, you know, the, the country council, the training committee, various working groups that sort of sit on there uh, and various sort of steering groups, etc. So, you know, keen and, and, and passionate about MUPES and safety. Um, so, you know, again, um, hopefully I can pass on some of my experiences to you today. So just a quick look about what MUPS. So MUPS is Mobile Elevated Working Platform. Um, appreciate that might not be um, everybody's um, normal terminology, cherry picker, scissor lift, you know, magic carpet, etc. But basically, it is a machine. And this that definition is there, was written back quite a few years ago. Um, and it's actually taken from BS8460, which is the code of practice for the safe use of MUPS. Now that code of practice as you would expect is 2005 it's well overdue its review um, but obviously with the with the recession and such it got put on hold at the moment it is currently undergoing a, a, re, a rewrite a review um, and uh, we're hoping to have that out sort of latter part of October 2017 very specific from BSI um, that document itself covers a lot of things um, and, and important aspects of, of using MUPE safely, such as hazard spotting. You know, the, what we as an industry, we as a best, uh, as a as a guidance, tell you these are the main hazards. It's going to look at um, management of MUPEs. Um, so, you know, what control and what responsibilities you have when your know, MUPEs are on your site, when you're ordering MUPEs. Clearly, we're going to look at safety at work sites uh, during in, in the in this uh, code of practice. You know, how we look at you know, working at height safely, you know, making sure we don't become a casualty. It goes into depth on training, attributes of people, um, selecting the right people to work at height. And then it then uh, moves on to planning um, and positioning of the machine. So planning a job, you know, as we, as you're probably aware, all um, work at height must be planned. It's got to be supervised and carried out safely. So again, you've got to make sure that you understand what's in there. Um, and then, of course, we go through maintenance and through examination tests and etc. So it's a very, very good document. Um, I'm involved with IPATH in the rewrite of this. Um, I do hope that you know once it's actually released, you know it will certainly bring into into uh, an up to date a lot of the no, now more modern uh, aspects of of MUPS. Okay, so um, this isn't health and safety today in terms of you know looking at all the legislation and guidance. There's a rake of legislation and, 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 and guidance out there. Um, but, you know, in, in truth, you know, if we're hiring MUPs, we've got the Health and Safety Work Act. Then we've got certain regulations that we have to comply with. And, you know, to, lane, to, to name a few, provision and use of work equipment regulations, lifting operations, lifting equipment regulations, so that's pure and lower. The management of health and safety at work regs, you know, you're looking at RIDOR, so reporting of accident uh, diseases, dangerous occurrences. Um, COSH, all, all them sort of things that you need to look at. So they are the rules effectively, you know, we've got to, to comply with. And then after that, then you have approved codes of practice, 
that supplement the, the guidance or you have codes of practice which is what I've just mentioned previously with BS8460. So that is how to, you know, everything sort of acts and regulations, they are law. Approved code of practice, effectively best practice, you know, it's the, it's the grey matter, how we comply you know, and how we can put enough information into and, and procedures into complying with the act and the regulation. So uh, codes of practice are not um, uh, law, but they are and can be used in court um, to show that you've you've unfortunately not made the requirements. But then we have a rake of standards and guidance, and that standards and guidance, I'm going to go through some of that today, and hopefully you'll find some of it useful. Even if I can signpost you to some documents that you've never really sort of, um, you know, aware of, um, because you know I am mindful there are many working groups going on, um, and what you've got to do is make sure that you understand, you know, at least have sight of these and understand what the, the implications of them. And then we have industry best practice. You know, we we have a, a huge, um, you know, engineering, construction, you know, pharmaceutical. Um, highways industry that uses these machines you know the rail industry you know airports so we're going to look down some of these aspects in a, in a bit and hopefully give you a little bit more information on that okay so guidance wise um, in addition to the review of BS8460 the code of practice for the safe use of MUPS you know there are a number of free guidance and best practice documents available now these are freely available to download as you would expect I would encourage you, encourage you to both visit our own website we've got a number of them on there and also the ipath.org website. Um, now, this guidance that's shown here is some of the ways that we can, or you know, we can um, exam examples there, some of the technical guidance notes that you can show you basic legal requirements when you're operating, managing, supervising, or using MUPS. Um, I will say now that some of these, as you can see, are a single page, an example of a pre-use check sheet. Um, there's a unfortunately not a very uh, clear picture of the safe use of MUPS from BSI. So as you can see, that's a, um, a little out of date. But um, and then what we've got then is the uh, one of the probably one of the I would say concise pieces of uh, um, documents um, put together by the Construction Plant Air Association um, under the Strategic Forum for Construction, the Plant Safety Group, and that's ground conditions for construction plant. Now you might think, well, I'm, some of you that are listening today, you may not well be on a um, construction site but some of these some of this information that they discuss uh, and showing this is pertinent to use in all industries so I would advise that you at least have some sight of that um, you know I think like guidance on familiarization fall protection you know if you're working in agricultural so safety and you know tree felling been a number of fatalities involving involving tree tree surgeons over the years and probably one of the last pieces of documents that have had quite a lot of information. I was involved in this document is, you know, avoiding trapping and crushing injuries to people in the platform. So that's just a snapshot of, of, of some of the guidance out there. Um, I would advise you to have a look at these, obviously. Uh, that's I've got to say that. Um, but ultimately, and they, it's up to your good selves to, to look at that. Um, you may also find that some of the previous webinars that I've done, which are on our website, by all means, um, you know, download them and, and, and read them. I've covered secondary guarding. I've covered, I've covered ground conditions. You know, I've covered some of the other aspects of, of machines familiarization. So, you know, if you haven't got the time to read it, to read it, then you might just feel that you know it may be appropriate to uh, to download um, one of our previous um, webinars. All right. So, um, operator training then. So, I'm going to focus specifically today here on IPAF operator training. I know there are other training courses out there, and I accept that. Um, but we, we are one of the largest training providers of this uh, of MUP training in the UK and also in, in the Middle East. Um, so before we go any further, um, the, the IPATH course is actually a one to three day course. Um, and this takes into account different levels of knowledge, experience and practice of, of would be operators. So clearly, you know, if we take the three day, an untrained person who's been operating mutes for some time is potentially going to need less practice than someone who has never operated before. I think we'd all agree that. Um, and I've been a trainer now for 20 plus years. Um, and I actually, you know, I, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to this because I can actually find some of the most experienced operators have actually got some of the worst bad habits to get rid of. Um, and, you know, you, you tend to find yourself, you know, looking at looking at the experienced operator thinking he wouldn't like to be in a platform with you so it, but then you can get into a new operator who does everything by the book and that's like that's how we drive that's how we learn um so i, I would always i always encourage you know one to three day course most people are going most training centers are going to sell you a one day course with that one day course we're going to go through all the new all the training 
people are going to get a poll card, a certificate, and you're going to get an, an OSG, an Operator's Safety Guide, and the logbook. Now that logbook is for documenting the experience. So should I jump on a, you know, climb onto a, a machine I've not been on before, fill out my logbook, I've used it for three hours, get my site manager then um, to go and sign to say that I've used it safely, happy days, hopefully we move on, and then, then move on to the next site. I might use it for three weeks on the same site. I don't have to fill in that logbook every day. So I could basically put one 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 thing for one um, entry in there for a week, end of the week, go and see the, the foreman, your boss, your line manager, get them to sign it off, and that's you basically covered in the fact that you've actually used that machine. Now, also as well, your IPATH card um, and, and certificate is internationally accepted, uh, and they are valid for five years. At the end of five years, you're going to have to do some type of renewal to renew your license, and that renewal is going to be revisiting a training centre. Now, you could say that some people then go and do the, the, um, the course again, um, I've had people before that have, you know, they're on their third time and I can see the frustration in their eyes sometimes thinking, God, I've listened to this guy now for another three, four hours before we get out to the machines. Now, there is another available option now, and this is the e-learning. And e-learning basically means now I can go and do the course, the theory test in my own time, be it at work, at home, on a Sunday afternoon with a cup of coffee, whatever, and then book in attend the training center and do the practical session only. So for some of your guys that, you know, maybe, you know, you may have some that are a little bit, um, you know, out of sorts of having to go and do the full day again, there is another option available. Um, and obviously courses these days are, uh, are audited by IPATH. So there are um, unannounced audits and also training center audits. So you could be assured of quality and consistency. Now, you may have seen this IPATH poster about, um, this was done quite a few years ago, probably about 19, probably 2000-ish, I think, um, when the categories changed. Um, and you can see there, um, we've got 1A, 1B, 3A, 3B. We've got Harness, Mass Climbing Work Platform, PAV, IAD, and MM, Mutes Managers. So just to give you an idea of um, what the three uh, means, um, the three means that the machine can be driven when elevated. The A means that the central project projection of the platform at the maximum inclination will never be outside the tipping lines. Or putting it simply, a 3A is a machine that can go straight up and straight down. It does have and potentially have a slide out deck. And that slide out deck can be a single deck or a double deck, which we'll discuss later. But the important factor there is it doesn't go outside its tipping lines. Um, 3B, um, again, means the machine can be driven whilst elevated, um, and again, even when operating, it may get outside, it may, um, that means that the, the central projection of the platform at the maximum inclination may be outside the tipping line, um, or it can project a, uh, beyond the confines of the chassis. So this is what we'd identify as a boom type platform. When we look at, so when we look at 3A, 3B, they are mobile machines, mobile, they can drive elevated, um, up to a certain degree. Some machines won't allow you to drive when you've got over a certain height. When we look at 1As and 1Bs, A and B is exactly the same, but the 1 is effectively means that this machine is static. So it's static in its operation. In other words, the, the superstructure above it will not lift until the, the base has been put stable. Okay, um, so still smart uh, training cards. Some of them have now gone smart. Um, and, you know, IPATH started doing um, smart training cards in 2015, issuing the, these cards. And you can see that by the little Wi-Fi symbol um, on, on the top right hand of the card. So these cards now have potential amazing benefits for security and traceability of a person's training history, operating history, um, and you know where they've been on the machines. Um, it has the capability to, to ensure that only trained and authorized persons operate a MUP. And now that is only with a caveat of the fact that it has the correct reader or device fitted to that MUP. So I could take a certain type of machine, put a reader on that machine, that device is um, configured only to allow you know, Brian Parker to use that machine. Okay, and, and that is it. Now, should Fred Smith come along and oper try to operate it, he swipes his card, it will give him a big fat no. Um, but not only that, it will record and log the fact that Fred Smith has tried to operate that machine. So that's your talking point to him and say, look, why are you trying to operate somebody else's machine or potentially a machine that you're not trained or authorized to use? Um, you can select, so that for then is a, it's a selection where you can, um, you know, basically allow only certain people to operate that machine. Um, it will track the equipment when it's in use, uh, and you can help and decide how many mutes are potentially uh, needed for a project. 
um, all all these um, sort of devices and readers come with a type of software um, and they're going to highlight you know over or under use so um, so if you've got capacity in the system you know you might say well look we've got three machines there that are sat you know probably doing 60 percent work let's you know instead of hiring another machine in why can't we over you know overuse them machines um but i think probably one of the, the best things that i've seen from it is we can't have machines being borrowed anymore and the borrowing i say borrowing um in inverted commas often it's used without your knowledge and your consent more often um and you know when you get the damage charge or the damage notification for the you know the bent cage or the you know the, the smashed canopy um your operator is clearly going to say well it wasn't me that did it um and then after that you're then out there looking to see you know and, and and who used it and of course you're never going to get anybody honestly come up to you and say well actually yeah it was me that stuffed it into the wall or the other steelwork so with a reader fitted it's simple you know your machine's there where you left it because they can't start it up and use it um so there are tangible benefits in that sense so once we've trained our people, we then have to familiarise them. Um, and let's be let's be clear: after you've trained the operator, you still have a legal responsibility to provide familiarisation. Um, now, all of the items that it's saying there, and it says they're required when using a machine which differs significantly from the training you received. Machine-specific familiarisation should follow on from your basic training, so your one to three days. But then it must cover the instructions and the warnings from this certain manufacturer. What features have got? what control functions it's got, what safety devices are fitted, and of course, how to bring it down in the event of a serious or, 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 or a serious or, or, you know, could be a, a, a machine breakdown, as simple as that. Now, all of that is going to be found in the information that's supplied with the machine, which is the operator's manual. Um, for those of you who know MUPES, will know that the operator's manual is going to be in the platform. Um, so you're not going to be able to gain access to that manual nine times out of ten. Okay, so before we then um, move on to it, we need to survey. So a survey is a location by a competent person prior to the use of the MUP, and that's in order to assess for hazards associated with that location, and you know, as far as is what is reasonably practicable, the work that's going to be carried out. There may be unforeseeable things in there that we, you know, you've not looked at, but you've trained your people. They should understand that you know, if we come across something that's un un unreasonable or they're a little bit uncertain, they stop and come and see you. But then it should determine the most suitable MUP and the method of use for that task to be undertaken. For any survey to be carried out, there are cons countless considerations to be mindful of. You know, and I got some of the things here, things like, you know, um, is the ground, the surface, capable of taking the weight? What's the area, to access area to the area like, you know, in terms of width, height, length, turning ability? Is it the right type of machine for you working in? Is it diesel working inside? Is it petrol working indoors, the fumes? Have your machine operators been trained? Have they been familiarised? Have you got a rescue plan? And of course, have you took into account that the risk assessment has covered all aspects of risk and hazards? Without doubt, one of the issues which arise to the area um, is access, you know, be that the width, the height or the length considerations, but also potentially restrictions on the ground. Um, we've got to travel this machine over the ground. Um, we've got to get it from point A to point B. Whether that point A is coming off the, um, the the loading truck and getting it across, you know, the grass, the tarmac, you know, the slabs, um, you know, whatever type of material you've got. So I've lost count over the years of the experience of people tracking, driving, or moving mupes into an area, only to either get it stuck, sink into the ground, or God forbid, overturn the machine. Dare I say, it, you know, sometimes it results in costly repairs, uh, injury. Uh, or even you know, in the press you've seen fatal incidents and fatal accidents. You know, when a simple walk of the route first would have identified potential his, uh, issues, hazards, and possibly even presented, uh, prevented this. So easy to sort of say, yeah, I'd, I, I would have walked the route, but I didn't have time. Yeah, well, try telling that to my family. So um, in the UK, approximately between 55 and 60,000 MUPs. Um, and as you would expect with these, um, there's different manufacturers ranging from different types, models. Some machines have indoor capability only, um, and of course, machines are also able to go outdoors. Each manufacturer, as we understand and, and, and respect really, are attempting to develop new machines with different configurations, applications, and uses at all time. Um, so what we're seeing now is technology working in the manufacturer's favor uh, by designing MUPs, which in some way rely on safety systems for various aspects. So we'll cover safety systems on machines a wee bit later on. Um, but when we are looking at this, some of the criteria when we're looking at height and outreach, we're going to cover that a bit later. Access we've mentioned. 
any overhead structures that the operator can be crushed against. Um, and now, once we've agreed the type of machine, we need to then consider, um, you know, to um, you know to to, ma to manage them risks. So, um, in each operator's manual and spec sheet, spec sheets that you could also find on on the internet, um, you'll find the working envelope of a machine. Now, it's critical for tasks when a specific height has been requested. So the difference um, that we need to be me aware of is the difference of platform and working height is two meters or six foot. You may, you know, you, I I was always surprised and I thought nobody could make that, but there've been some big blunders in in MUP hire before. You know, some big blunders as far as someone opts to take the tasks on themselves. You know, they don't take in the rentals request to come and do a site survey to find out that the working height, but they've stately wrongly stated the platform height. So when they get up to the full height, they find that they're actually um, you know two two meters short or six foot. So what do they tend to do then? They climb on the guardrails because we didn't hire a machine that was big enough. Or they identified the height and the reach, but not calculated the up and over capability of the, of the machine. It can be costly mistakes. So if you're in doubt about this, you know, we need to, you know, I, I would advise you to uh, to uh, ask for a rental survey. They're free of charge. You know, we'll, we'll send out a, a um, field sales representative will come out to you and look, um, you know, look at the job. Now, North American manufacturers, um, Genie, Skyjack, uh, JLG, they um, put their machines up to platform height, so it's, and that's normally in feet, so 45 foot, and that will be to the platform height. Whereas European machines, their maximum is their maximum is the working height, and that's normally identified in meters. Um, there we can see an example of a machine there. Um, so you can see there, if you can see what I'm meaning about up and over height. Um, so you can understand how you can maybe get that that wrong. You can see up in the top right hand side of uh, in, in the area where you know you're hopefully going to reach that, and you, you find that you don't you, or you can't. Also, that machine has a capability to go um, below ground level, so what we consider to be negative reach. And that's what I mean by platform height and working height. So you know you can see there what 2.5 meter platform height, but it gives you 4.5 meter working height. Um, but you know, ensure that you know you get the right you get the right mix, uh, and make sure you don't get that wrong. Hopefully, that kind of um, is, is quite easy for you to understand there. Okay, we also now come to model numbers, um, and numbers depict the model of the machine. So I've picked two North American machines here um, and manufacturers, and you can see the two sets of model numbers: 1932 and 3219. Don't worry about the Genie. The GS is a Genie scissor, and the Skyjack is SJ. So you can see 1932 and 3219. Essentially, these are the same numbers swapped round to you know to the individuality of, of, of the companies. Okay. Now, 19 is the feet in height to the platform height. So to get the working height, you guessed it, we've got to add two meters or six foot to achieve that working height. Okay. So 19 is the feet in height. Um, the amount of times I've asked, what does the 32 ask? Uh, sorry, what does the 32 mean? Um, and I've got weight, I've got, uh, you know, all sorts of configurations people said to me. 32 is how many inches wide it is. Uh, so this is going to help you with clearance through doorways, etc. But what it isn't going to tell you is, on that particular one, is the closed height. And what I mean by closed height is, for example, when it's down, um, and I'm stood by the side of that, I'm six foot, so my head's going to be roughly around the top guardrails height of them, both their machines. Um, but of course that might not get through a doorway. So we can we can lower the guardrails and then take the machine through through the doorway. It's not going to tell me about length. All right, so again that's where we have to be a little bit mindful of looking at spec sheets um, and making sure that we understand the, the size of it. So 19 foot height in feet to the platform. 32 is how many inches wide it is. Okay, so now I understand that North American manufacturers work in feet. But when we look at uh, a boom type mute like the Genie Z4525 uh, DJS there, this refers to both the height and the reach in feet. Now, none of the, what we need to remember, remember this is, this is not achievable at the same time. So I can't go 45 foot up and 25 foot out, all right? Because I'm, go I'm going to have an envelope like I showed you earlier. But when that lower boom is fully um, extended up and the top boom, or we'll cover that later, is horizontal, when I tell it out, I can achieve 25 foot. The D would denote that it's a diesel. The J would denote that it's got a jib fitted to, it, fitted to it. And within our fleet, the S would indicate that the machine is fitted with a secondary guarding device, which I'll cover a wee bit later on. Okay. Um, 
But when we come to a European spec machine, in this case you can see on the right hand side, a Nifty HR15, like I said earlier, this is measured in meters and that's your working height. So to identify the platform height, you simply subtract two meters from that number and it will give you that platform height. So in this case, it'd be 13 meters. But what you'll find with a lot of European machines, they do not depict the reach like the North Americans do. OK, so again, important that you have a look at the spec sheet, check that you've got the right, series, the, you know, the right fleet number and you understand the right type of machine. OK, so over that's just a kind of a, a quick run through that. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier about how we can always try and improve on this is we can we can do training and operators could be trained on operators courses, but also uh, mute for managers courses will cover all the legal aspects of, of their of their responsibilities when hiring uh, and um, you know managing and supervising mutes on site. When we run the mutes for managers course, like we go into depth with these um, you know model numbers and such, and, and try and get people to understand some of the semantics of these sort of things. Okay, through examinations and ID plates then. So it goes without saying we must comply with the law when it comes to ensuring that the mute is safe to use. It's got to be suitable and clearly it's got to be fit for purpose. Set aside from that, it must have an in date six monthly through examination before it is used for work. Manufacturers, okay, will do a certificate of conformity, which is valid for 12 months from the date of conformity. When it comes to a rental company like ourselves, nine times out of 10, you'll find our sales will do a new thorough examination. So that thorough examination is from six months. So how we um, would deliver that to you in, in some respects is either by the plate that you can see at the bottom, uh, bottom on there, on the bottom picture, and accompanied by a certificate. If you are a customer of ourselves and you're on our um, um, web portal, our web portal will will also automatically send you the thorough examination when you hire the machine. So effectively, you always know that um, you know the machine is, is has come out with a thorough examination. It's your responsibility to manage that thorough examination. However, as a rental company, we tend to do it for you, but it still doesn't take away your responsibility. Um, I mentioned earlier about the readers. Um, the readers also have the ability to stop the machine from being used if it's not got a thorough examination. So that's kind of like a, a backup should something unfortunately go wrong and you know, you're know you busy people and you miss that thorough examination. Um, and unfortunately, you know, God forbid an accident happens, you can have health and safety all over you. One of the very first things they'll ask for is training. Next thing is thorough examination. If you haven't got one of them, um, you know, you're certainly going to be asking a few questions. So um, we've got the third examination. Um, on there, you'll find a serial number. And that serial number is going to relate to a serial number that is going to be on the top plate that you can see on your picture there. That serial plate number and your serial number on your third examination must match up. And, you know, tongue in cheek, I've had it before when I've been on site where somebody's actually taken the sticker and change the third examination from one machine to another machine to make it appear as though that machine was still in date. So just be mi mindful. Um, obviously, no ID plate on the machine, or you can't find it, you should really go and speak to your supervisor, because ID plates can be in various places. Um, I've had them in wonderful locations before where even I'm scratching my head trying to find them. You know, I found them on the chassis, the boom. You've had to lift the scissor pack up so you can see inside the scissor pack behind hoses. So, you know, just be mindful that sometimes, you know, we may have to actually start the machine up to lift it um, to find it. OK, um, so we already know the operator's manual has got to be supplied with the machine. That's one of our legal responsibilities, duty of care to other people, other persons. The location of the manual, we often know that 99.9% .9 of the time that manual is located and fitted to the platform. We've got to make sure it's the right type, it's legible, okay, and it's got to be, um, you know, used accordingly. But when, nine, when something goes wrong, 99% of the time that manual is in the elevated uh, platform. So wishing to rely on it to operate the MUP in an emergency scenario would be wholly wrong. Sometimes decals relate to safety warnings and manufacturers have their own way of putting decals on machines um, in different formats. So sometimes these are going to be things like safety, movement, directional control decals. All right, But sometimes you may have a decal which is also effectively a bit of an information set decal. You've got the little red one at the top there, that's a warning, that's a safety decal and yet here it's telling you pertinent information about that machine, how many people, the wind loadings, uh, you can see this particular machine is zero, so you know um, on that particular one, it shouldn't be going out. It shouldn't be out, out, used outdoors. We've got the slope, side slope, and the the longitude and lateral slope. We've got the maximum weight. So all these sort of things, very 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 important um, 
information and certainly good for the users, planners, users and managers. So the endless um, array of different types of machines uh, if, in, and which one do we go for? All these categories conform to EN 280 2013 which is the latest revision of the design standards for MUPS and the stability criteria. So a 3A machine we commonly know it as a, as a scissor lift. Um, it can be an X-type, as you can see at the bottom and the top, or a Sigma-type, as you can see in the middle there, so like a boom scissor. Okay, That particular machine is a speed leveler, so it'll level itself out when it's a bit on even ground, as you can see the chassis. Some machines have slab um, capability. When I mean a slab scissor, it means it means it can only be going on concrete or solid floors, whereas some machines have rough terrain capability. Um, Safe working load wise, the, the machine in the top, the scissor lift at the top, that's a, a, a Holland lift 32 meter. You can take a thousand kilograms up in that to 32 meters. Um, and that machine will actually drive at 32 meters too. I've done that. It's not for the faint hearted, trust me. Um, it's a, you know, we're, we're talking 31.2 ton for that machine. So, you know, you've got to be really sort of comfortable, um, you know, with with doing that for foremost, but you've got to be confident that the ground can take the take the weight. Heights wise, uh, you know, again, it's quite a climb just to climb into it. So you've got that sort of uh, scenario too. Now, in energy wise, um, there are the various types of energy sources: biofuel, by energy, hybrid, diesel, petrol, gas, battery. There's all sorts of types. We'll cover that a little bit later on. Um, now, in terms of uh, deck extensions, um, some of them are going to be manual uh, or some may be hydraulic. There's always going to be reduced working load on that deck. So effectively, when it's out, it's like walking the plank or you know, stepping on the, um, on the springboard into the swimming pool. You're going to put extra weight on there. So it's mindful of, of you know, making sure that um, that weight is not uh, overloaded on there. Um, also as well, again, just sowing the seed. But if that deck is extended, and I'll show you a picture of a deck extended later, just be mindful of um, the fact that we often extend it to go over an obstacle. The minute that we've gone over that obstacle, uh, God forbid something goes wrong, we're going to have serious problems trying to retract that deck um, to, to lower the full machine down. Um, wonder leading. Uh, wonder leading refers to, for example, the bottom picture. Um, I've collapsed the guardrails, lowered the guardrails, I took the control box off the machine and now I'm going to drive it standing by the side of the machine. So wonder leading or, or dog walking. There are risks to doing that, clearly one of the you know, crushing, entrapment, crushing of my feet, my body. Um, I did do a HSCQ bulletin notice on this not so long ago. So again, if you want more information on that, you know, please look. Uh, and of course, they may have uh, stabilizers fitted. So these are all things that we need to make sure that we understand um, and, and aware of. 3B, um, mobile boom. So we have either articulated or telescopic booms. So teles uh, telescopic on the bottom and articulated on the top. Um, Again, slab or rough terrain capability, not commonly known as a cherry picker. Um, I've never ever picked cherries out of them. Um, these machines currently we go up to 185 foot and they will drive at 185 foot. There are talk of certain manufacturers trying to break the magic 200 foot barrier. Um, whether or not it will drive or not at that height, I don't know, but I suspect it probably will. So again, quite a long, uh, long way up. Um, again, Similar type of thing on the power source. Um, again, you've got to make sure that you, you understand these types. Typical booms, you're going to be for two people plus tools. But again, you know, two, three um, is not uncommon. What we refer to is the capacity of the platform. So the articulated boom is going to provide you with up and over reach. Whereas the telescopic machine is what we'd call a, a point to target machine. So in other words, I've got to be able to see it within reason because I have got a small jib there. Um, uh, to get to it. Now energy source is just to cover both machines, um, diesel, petrol, uh, diesel and, and, and battery are the most common type for them. Petrol, very uncommon, but you know some of the older versions may have them and obviously um, and, and uh, gas, LPG. But you will also get bifuel and bifuel uh, machines means that you have diesel and electrical available in the same unit, but they work independently of one another. So commonly available up to about 15 meters. A bi-energy machine means that you have diesel and electrical again at the same time, but when the diesel is running, it will trickle charge the electrical side of the machine. So in other words, it will trickle charge your machine up, um, and you would typically use you know, your, your diesel outdoors and your, and, your, and your electrics side of it inside. 
Um, hybrid though predominantly works on electric and diesel and the diesel will come in when it's required to boost the power. Um, now these are commonly available up to 20 meters but they're also available now on um, on some of the, the large scissors uh, and I know some of the uh, the European scissors now are certainly going down the hybrid side. Static booms, um, as you can see, these can be road-going vehicles, they can be towed, um, they can be road-driven, or they can also be tracked machines. Um, again, because it is a static boom, it's a boom, but it will not lift up until it is static, so effectively it's going to set up on outriggers and stabilizers. Um, and these range from anything from you know two tons up to 60 plus tons in gross weight. Um, safe working loads in the platform, sometimes you can have five, six people in these platforms. Um, and uh, you know you're talking you know hell of a hell of a weight at the base. Um, the available heights um, in terms of, of this we'll cover on the next slide. But if you look at that as well, some types of machines are capable of being pedestrian driven. So the bottom machine there, I can drive that from the ground, legs legs obviously folded away, and set into a certain position to prevent me from tipping it over and drive it from the ground. Static boom for me is one of the biggest range of a single mute category in terms of we used to have loads of different categories here but now it's just this one static boom category so available heights um, with our own branding Wilson access we can go up to 57 meters um, but the industry the the record at the moment is 112 meters um, you're talking something that's uh, yeah going to cost a, a mortgage to get the thing there to, to work, um, you know, to work. So you're talking huge things. We also have non-operated and operated. So on some of our, mach our machines, the, the industry standard tends to be around 20 meters or so. You can walk into a hire desk depot, you've got your driving license, your insurance, your payment, and you can drive the thing out the out the depot. But when you start to go over that height, all right, you tend to they become operated. Um, and it's very, I suppose, in some respects, once it's operated, it gives you, you with the customer, a bit of peace of mind to have an experienced operator on the machine while your tradesmen are, you know, carrying out the necessary jobs. Um, and obviously, these are flexible. You can do multiple jobs jobs in a day. Just to give you a bit of height and scalability, I told you it was the largest, uh, you know, single disparity of a single category. So there's something like a trailer mount. Um, it's about, about um, you know, 12 meters, uh, obviously not fully extent. And there's a truck mount. I'm sure you can probably see the vans in the ground there. That is the same category. All right, so I do a 1B, that's the same category. They are poles apart, okay, in size. Um, and I wouldn't expect anybody, you know, unless they were, you know, trained operator to be able to go and hire that and go out. That's going to come with an operator and, and for a very good reason. Okay, PAVs, um, very much quite unsurprisingly with these machines they're actually quite heavy um, and you don't realize it until you've got it on a slope or on a camber and suddenly the thing starts to get away from you so you've got to be mindful of the personal attributes of the person pushing this into place some machines have pendant controls um, so as you can see there in the middle picture I'm using my hand there to, to, to lift up and lower down the machine stood from the side of the machine carrying out my pre you know my function checks um, some uh, you can see in the bottom picture there I'm manually applying the rear casters um, before I climb into it but when that machine then elevates, and you can see the picture on the right-hand side, it auto-brakes too. Now, a few years ago, they never used to auto-brake, so unfortunately what you'd have is people pulling themselves along the ducting as they were doing it. Um, that has now kind of thankfully uh, seem, seemingly been um, stopped because there's been a, a, a re refit of most manufacturers now to basically have these as auto-brakes. Um, safe working load wise I've seen some of these larger than a than a than a three a of a scissor lift and um, so you know you've got to be mindful these things they're not toys at all you might think them as you know just something that lifts up one and a half meters but the amount of weight and power this has and the force that it has it can be quite un unnerving generally speaking these are for one person and they're generally indoor use only um, and again we find them being used outdoors we find them being used next to roller shutter doors with a door open at the other end so you've got a howling gale coming through um, common, commonly used to find, you know, they'd have two people in these machines instead of one. Uh, and what you be mindful of is, you know, that, that 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 for one person because how narrow they are, uh, and and the lack of weight. If we take a, a scissor lift the same size, you'd be probably talking, you know, over a, over a ton. You know, that particular machine is around about 250, 300 kilograms. So, you know, ma ma massive differences. 
Static vertical, not a common machine. They still have the uses. Um, generally an indoor type machine, but one manufacturer has, has designed, that I know of, designed it for an outdoor use. Operator stands in the platform to drive it, but then has to stabilize it and critically will, will not drive whilst it's at height. So effectively that kind of, um, you know, renders it as a static vertical. There are a couple of specials out there as well. Um, so where there is a solution, it's needed um, and doesn't fit into the, any of the existing categories. Manufacturers design MUFs which meet that requirements. An example here is like an underbridge unit on the, on the top left, a rail mounted machine on the top right, and an airport de-icer. Um, so these are, you know, these are things where they, this machine, which travels with a raised work platform whilst controlled from a point of control at the chassis. So the underbridge unit, it can actually drive from the, um, the, the man's under the, under the bridge and he can drive from the, from the cab, same for the rail and same for the, um, um, you know, uh, airport de-icing type machine. Okay. Right, so we're now moving on to stabilizing and leveling, and this is quite a big section, and hopefully it'll make sense when it, when we go through it. Main types of supports that we're going to get for MUPS are things like wheels and tires. We're going to get tracks. We're going to get oscillating axles, stabilizers and outriggers. Some of you may have heard the word jack, and, and jacks, I've known jacks for 20 years ago, jack, you know, jacking a machine up. Um, there is no definition in any of the standards for a jack. It's either stabilizer or an outrigger. We're also going to look at pothole protection and extending axles. And we've got a couple of little videos to show you on these as well. So straight away, I'm going to look at pothole protection, commonly found on scissor, plat scissor lifts. And this will deploy when the scissor platform is raised. Uh, so this is actually a type of stabilizing device. On a slab floor machine, so meant for col concrete or solid floors, when you have a pothole device fitted to your machine, um, when you're driving the scissor lift along, lowered, this, these pothole devices, which you can see on the right-hand picture, is not visible. Um, but when you start to lift the machine, okay, so you can see on the top, on the on the right-hand page, I'm just starting to lift the machine. You can see the pothole device has now actually come out. Now they do deploy in different ways, um, and sometimes um, even when you've come fully down the pothole protection device will still be visible. It's not until you engage drive that the pothole devices then flick up and out the way. Um, so it's obviously very important that you keep everybody clear of that area. Uh, somebody could have a seriously bad day. Now, if the um, pothole device does not deploy correctly, an alarm could sound in the platform or the function will be stopped. So effectively, it's going to have some type of limit switch. And that is basically going to what we call fail to safe. Um, if you... Um, if you can imagine now you lift up and because you are so narrow with the machine that you've got on, if you're driving along and you drive into a, a grate, into a, into a pothole, into a, you know, a, a drain or something, this will, this will, this pothole protection device will dig into the ground and prevent the tip over um, of the machine uh, or the overturn. So effectively doing its job. Um, that particular machine, as you can see there, is probably around about an inch and a half from the ground. There are some machines that they go even further down. So, you know, you like half an inch clearance. So you can imagine now a block on the piece of, you know, like piece of, um, you know, timber on the floor could actually technically prevent this pothole protection device from deploying. And what it'll do is it'll stop the machine, sound alarm, and you'll have to come down. Oscillating axles. Um, now, there are two types, passive and active. Um, and a passive oscillating axle uh, on the chassis of a mute this moves freely during travel with the MUPS elevating structure. So when you, um, and this will move in a limited and defined configuration to ensure that within the limits of oscillation, all the wheels remain in contact with the ground. Now, now once the MUPS elevating structure moves out of a defined configuration, the axle is then locked and this will remain at that angle of oscillation until the elevating structure returns to the defined configuration down. You can see the picture on the right hand side there, so hopefully you can see the chassis then on that skyjack boom, as, as uh, on the side, on, on, the, on the left hand side it's locked, on the right hand side it's unlocked. Now an active oscillating axle on a self-propelled mute moves in a controlled manner to ensure that within the limits of oscillation all wheels remain in contact with the ground. ground. The controlled oscillation ensures that the mute remains stable during travel with the elevated structure raised in the transport position. So use these many years and, and what you tend to find is nobody ever does an oscillating axle check. So just to show you, I've used um, one of our videos that we use for our familiarization videos. That's me in the platform. So you can see, see, uh, see me just about to prepare this machine right? and hopefully um, 
Let me just start that video back from the start. Sorry about that. So I've got the machine fully lowered. The boom's in the centre. Got a block in front of the tyre. So I'm going to drive now up onto the block. And you can see now that axle has, has moved. I'm now going to rotate round to the right hand side of the machine. And then I'm going to drive back off that block. So you might just be able to see now this front left hand wheel that's highlighted is slightly off the ground. And as I rotate back round, you can see it bouncing a little bit as, as the weight transfers. I get back to the center point. Now sometimes they will release there, but if not, then you've got to drive. As I drive, you'll see it'll drop. Okay, quite simple, quite straightforward. Great machine. Once you've checked one side, you're going to go and check check the next side. So hopefully you could understand what I'm trying to say there. Um, not sure if you could hear the, the, my voice on the on the familiarisation video, but again, these are available for you. So okay, stabilisers and outriggers. So this uh, stabilizer is a device or system uh, used to stabilize the MUPE without lifting the MUPE chassis from the ground. An outrigger is a device which increases the base area of the unit, um, which then increases um, the MUPE stability, capable of, then capable of lifting and leveling the MUPE. A spreader pad is used to increase the area under a stabilizer, an outrigger, a wheel or a track to reduce the ground bearing pressures. So you can see the, the, the picture there, um, I'm on concrete ground about you know, about 15 inches thick so there's no way that I'm going to punch through with the ground with there all right but if I was on soft ground I would have to take necessary la you know load ins ground setup material to ensure that I've got it in, a, in the right position and put the necessary um, you know pads or whatever or, or, or ground bearing um, um, pads underneath there to reduce the pressures now an extending axle um, these ultimately are going to again rely on the ground to which they're stone uh, stood on and that we know this as their point of contact um, you can see on the two top pictures there um, that the axles are uh, on the left hand one the axles are retracted and on the right hand one the axles are extended and these are going to extend to increase again your supporting base of the MUPE um, a, if I look now at the film now if you look here now again show you here and this is an example of the the um, the axle extending So I'm driving forward now and backwards, pressing a button on the on the plant platform, and you can see now then it went into its locked position. So into its locked position, it's then going to become wider, which in turn was then going to allow the machine to lift up. Without them axles in the extended position, the booms will not lift. Um, so in truth, before you ever lift up a machine um, that's got extending axles, you should test that the machine as it will not lift up when the axles are uh, in the retracted position, a common error for some people. Now, now typically, um, and I mentioned about going over a certain height, when we start to get over 65 foot, uh, up to 80 foot machines, that's where you typically find um, extending axles coming into, um, you know, in, in, into, into their own. Um, so that particular extending axles are going to operate in different ways. On some machines, a jack is used, and a jack is lowered from the centre of the machine, and that will pick up the chassis and allow the axles to be extended. The type that you've just seen there is what's known as a drive out, and that's the more modern way of doing it. So you, you drive the machine forward and backwards, engage a switch on the control panel, and that will drive out the extension um, to, pu to push out the, um, the, the axles. Okay, so hopefully that kind of takes us like a, a, through through some of the sort of stabilising devices. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So structural parts then. Okay, um, so um, we're going to the. Um, I picked this um, JLG 450, so for 45 foot boom, um, which is an articulated machine. Um, other machines are available, obviously, but just example, give you one example of this machine. I haven't got uh, ability to do them all. So, foam-filled tyres. Looks like a normal tyre. Foam-filled. The tyre starts out as a pneumatic tyre, but then is but then is filled with a substance called tyre fill. This foam maintains the pressure of the tyre and will sometimes, though not always, um, have a bolt in the tyre. 
Okay, so we can indicate that it's got a bolt in the tire. Now, basically, opposite the valve, there's the valve uh, at the bottom right of the picture. What you can't see in that picture is the is the bolt. But when you look at the uh, the, the opposite there, so 180 degrees opposite to in the in the tire, you may see a bolt. That's to indicate that it's a foam filled tire. Not always will they have that bolt though, so just be mindful of that. Uh, advantages. Clearly, you're not going to get any punctures. It's still going to maintain its rough terrain capability. But the disadvantage is, because it's extra weight in the tyre now, it's going to in increase the, ha the bearing pressure of the, onto the ground. Okay, solid tyres, um, mainly for indoor use. Um, so nice, flat, precision, concrete floors, um, you know, solid floors. These can be non-marking tyres. Um, and what we know is typically is a white tyre. Um, and they will prevent damage to floors. Um, when you're not using non-marking tyres, you need to remember to protect any finished floors because you will leave deposits of, of black rubber on the ground. Again, advantages, it's hard wearing, you're not going to get a, a, a puncture, uh, they're small and they're compact. Again, disadvantages, because this is a small wheel, you're going to get high uh, grounding pressure at the very, what we call a point of contact with that ground. Okay, turntable. Um, as you can see there, this is going to control the rotation of the turret, sometimes 360 degrees, sometimes not. Um, it can, um, mindful as well, it can also reverse the upper structure. Um, so basically when you reverse the upper structure, forwards is backwards and backwards is forwards on some machines. So we'll cover that in a, slight, slight, in a minute. Also just on some track machines, um, some machines, track machines, there is potential to hit yourself. And what I mean by that is rotate yourself around and actually hit maybe your engine canopy or um, part of the superstructure. Um, some machines are clever enough to stop and tell you that you're actually going to hit yourself. Some aren't. So just be mindful of the different sort of machines that's out there and, and being familiar with them. Chassis orientation decals. So this is going to designate which way is forwards and which way is backwards. And this is going to be backed up in the, in the platform. Now again, different manufacturers are going to do it different ways using different color coded systems um, just because of that's their individuality. The previous one there, you've got the white, um, oops, I want, you've got the white and, and the black, um, whereas here now you've got the blue and the yellow. You're going to get red and green on some machines. They all use all different colors to give you an idea. Okay, your lower or your secondary boom. So this is going to control um, you know your, your main riser boom lower boom um, and this is a single boom on this particular machine but you can also see that this is a telescopic boom this i've chose this picture because this is over 100 you know over 100 foot so that particular machine you know in, in this particular one the lower boom which is the little um cream boom that you see at the bottom there has almost got almost got to go more or less vertical before the orange sections will start to extend um, so yeah, um, and you can see the articulation point at the top there. Um, so if we were explaining up and over, there's your articulation point. Upper boom, um, upper boom now, then this is the point, what we call the point to target boom. So if I want to get to a certain position, I've got to have that angled at 45, 50, 60, 70 degrees, and then I will then telescope out. So when I'm ever at positioning a machine, there is a, there is a word which I'll, I'll cover a little bit later on, but you know, when we're looking at that, this is one of the, your telescoping of your boom. The last, the last is one of the last things that you should do because you've got finer control on on that machine um, when you're doing that. Your jib, as you can see, the jib. So the jib there, it can move up and it can move down, but it's, it can also rotate, uh, and it can rotate from the um, knuckle there on on the top left. So what we call the jib rotate. The platform. Um, so. We've got the working height, we've got the platform height, we're going to have guardrails in there which offer uh, collective protection, and we've got various entry points. Um, inside there you're going to have lan lanyard anchorage points, platform controls, and, and secondary guarding uh, devices potentially fitted. That one has got one. You can see on the left there you've got the control box. You've also got underneath that machine um, a safe load system as well. So effectively underneath there, that black bar has four solenoids um, type devices on, on their limit switches and that will it basically weighs what's in the, inside the platform preventing you know an overload. Um, getting into the platform, there are different ways. So you know in that particular one there, you see my hand on it there, that's what we call a sliding mid rail. Commonly you find with sliding mid rails, you know people will tie them up, so they'll tie wrap them up prevent them from banging their head when they're climbing in and out, um, which obviously increases the risk of people falling out that gap because it doesn't offer put, uh, collective protection. Or you may have a full entry gate as such. And again, I've seen them tied back as well, just 
one of them things well unfortunately you know you are then higher at risk of, of falling out the platform okay so that's our structural parts of our boom as such when we look at the scissor lift um, or the mobile mobile vertical um, you can see there so again um, I've chose a, um, a diesel diesel scissor here from Skyjack and um, so different manufacturers something like an 88 um, 31 um, so 31 foot platform 88 inches wide so similar sort of scenario okay so tires exactly the same rough terrain tire we're going to have a bolt incidentally I said sometimes they don't have a bolt um, and what you might find is a, is, is a it might be like a screw head you might not actually be able to find anything so the last check that you could do is by taking the valve cap off if it has one and looking to see if you can see any of the black guns in the in the valve cap that will be a last kind of light check um, but equally as well we're going to have you know our non-marking tires as such um, from our chassis point of view okay that's where we're going to have you know the location of the ground controls now this particular machine you just can't see it. it's on the left there between the steps or to the left of the steps um, so that's how I lift and lower the machine from the ground I'm lifting that scissor lift up um, and I'm in the platform you can see the pothole protection device starting to fold out you see a little black and yellow warning tape at the bottom so as I as that lifts up then they will deploy okay um, remember the other type of scissor this is known as an X type the other type is known as a Sigma type the machine here you can see the steps are at the rear but you can also get machines where the steps are at the side both sides or you can also have steps that are at the front of the machine so again just making sure that you understand which ways forwards and which ways backwards very very important when I lift up a scissor lift um, I may need to get inside that scissor lift clean it take something out that's maybe got dropped in there and, and preventing the scissor lift from coming down so you can see there now I've deployed that um, safety support strut um, now this is manually fitted I actually have to reach in um, unscrew it uh, the, the locking bar and fold that into place um, now these again can be fitted on the side at the back um, um, or even at the front in some respects um, and again this often um, results in me as an operator having to reach in um, to actually unhook it to put it into its support point um, so again safety making sure we don't have anything lower onto us etc at the rear of the machine you're going to have the controls and you can see on this one now I've chose a different machine um, scissor pack is lowered you can see the pothole protection devices on your left hand side and you can clearly see what we call now a, a white non-marking tire totally different um, you can also see at the back of the machine there we've got braking system um, so when I let go she will automatically let go of the drive controller should I say she will automatically break um, and you can see an earthing strip there at the back on the floor to prevent any buildup of static um, you can also see um, the ground controls you can see the green button and the black button um, and you can see on the right hand side there there's a battery isolator so basically I flick that battery isolator little sort of silver key and that will isolate all batteries um, and again one of the reasons why I show this one is the forklifting pockets the forklifting pockets there are clear okay the amount of incidents I have been to where somebody has ignored them forklifting pockets and picked it up from the side of the machine and metal on metal isn't particularly the best thing to carry uh, and they've dropped the machine it's it's incredible um, whereas if they picked them up from the fork pockets they wouldn't have dropped the machine okay batteries um, positioned in various parts of the machine um, one thing to stress with batteries um, and this particular one one this is the part of the weight of the machine so effectively what I'd know is part of the counterweight of the machine so it's important that the, the right batteries are always used I, I've seen over the years machines come back with different sized batteries you know so in other words they've either blown the batteries up um, drained them dry boiled them dry whatever and they've changed the batteries uh, and unfortunately you've massively changed the configuration of the machine because you made it lighter um, so uh, other things to take into account are things like safety, um, for you know isolation of the batteries before we use them, connections, anything metal on my body, on my, you know my harness, tape measures, you know all sorts of things. I only have to touch a, you know from the battery case into one of them terminals, and I'm going to have a seriously bad day. When a machine is on charge like this, um, it will gas, and that gas that it gives off is hydrogen. So hydrogen, we want to be ensuring there's no naked flames. The area is well ventilated before we do anything that's hot works, etc. Uh, and clearly we need to ensure that people you know working with batteries are using the correct PPE um, so we'll be expecting a minimum impact resistant 
goggles, uh, visor, um, and acid um, resistant gloves and potentially apron. Um, in terms of um, you know taking the white tops off there there's a little bit of a debate should we take them off should we my view is yes we train people on the ipaf course how to um to, to inspect batteries and to look at the batteries properly and make sure they're right if there's not enough um uh, electrolyte in there and you put it on charge you do risk the run the risk of boiling batteries um, which can be you know potential fire done safely there's no risk whatsoever some some of my peers may disagree disagree i have gone to batteries that have been exploded in the past and to be fair most of the time i've found they've, they've cut corners and not done it properly and of course then you've got your guardrails um working height again um and then in some respects we may have to fold the guardrails so folding down the guardrails typically remove the pins and then fold it down but again from that ground position i am quite tall i can do it quite easily um, on that position folding down them guardrails i've got to be quite high in the air so you're going to have to have some type of safe system work to do that to prevent any issues and of course you're going to have some stabilizers or, uh, and possible protection devices there so they're the structural parts the main structural parts of, of the uh, the mobile vertical okay um, when we look at controls um, different manufacturers again shown here um, and you can see here now we've got typical things um, on the top of that drive controller I can see I've got steering okay left and right okay I've also got me color coded arrows remember earlier I showed you some of the blue and yellows um, but these are typically what we'd, we'd consider to be touch membrane controls um, and, and it's, they're not for everybody them um, some people like them some people don't um, you will also might get switches like on some of the on the other controls in the center one you can see a physical switch which you actually have to hold over uh, or sometimes you can have a lever like so and you can see the array of buttons up there that you have to press and energize and, and various things so being trained on one scissor doesn't necessarily give you the uh, the okay to jump on on them all without having a familiarization when we look at boom controls um, and again sample boom controls um, you can see they're similar for platform often though we'll get many many more controls in the platform um, you can see uh, the ground controls on, on, on some machines on the bottom on the right hand side examples of ground controls so I'll pick this particular machine if you look in between the yellow um, buttons on the bottom there you can see what we call the indents and these are them indents a little ri raised um, plastic in between the switches and that's what we know as primary guarding also as well the drive control lever on the right hand side you can't just engage that on its own it's got a collar you've got to lift up and you'll find a lot of these machines now um, are coming with timeout functions on on the foot switch which I've not shown but you've got a foot switch in the in the platform I've got to press the foot switch and they have a timeout function so if I've not if I've kept my foot on it but not operated a control within five to seven seconds I can't just energize a control I've got to take my foot off it's a positive um, acknowledgement that I am actually conscious of what I'm doing put my foot back on it and then operate it okay the great bit on these machines is this bottom little dial at the bottom there so you can move all boom controls from fast to slow so when I am getting up close to the actual work face you know it's a quick turn of the dial it'll slow the controls down you know and prevent any sort of really s sort of fast um, you know controls uh, or fast operation um, you can see there now the ground controls and this is a good example of a ground control color coding you can see the key color coding so orange is at base green is in platform you can see there's two keys on this one so you've actually physically got to turn it on there are some machines where you take turn it on you take the key out of that one and then put it into the where the green and the orange is um, you can see on the left hand side there um, this machine has a jack to lower the um, machine thus lifting it up off the ground to, pun to push out your axles. So remember earlier I said you got the drive out type, that's an example of, 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 the, of the, uh, the hydraulic jack inversion. Um, but also as well, you can see on the bottom right, uh, oh, sorry, no, bottom right, so in the blue section, you can see the M with the arrow. And that M is manual. Um, and that, for me, is what we know as our emergency. So that's our auxiliary emergency backup. So should I lose all power, that's my auxiliary power so holding that turning the key to the to the orange I can then operate the machine uh, to bring it down examples of emergency lowering uh, devices now again locations vary um, I'm sure somebody from uh, certain manufacturers in fact I know they are listening to this broadcast um, and also IPAF um, there's no it doesn't seem to be any common standards to where these should be located 
Sometimes I found emergency de uh, lowering, um, you know, inside a canopy, outside of a canopy, on one side of a machine, at the front of the machine, at the back of the machine. Um, I wish we'd come out with one standard and they've got to be positioned on that point so that, you know, hopefully we can never, ever sort of get that point where this emergency lowering or ground controls are positioned next to the wall. Um, so care, you know, it's got to be located. Care's got to be taken when you position the machine that these are always accessible. And simply on some of these machines, they, they might just be lowering valves. They might be a valve that you've got to pull and turn. It might simply be just, a, you know, like a red bar that you've got to pull. Um, you can see the picture there on the um, uh, in the centre at the top. There's a handle. I haven't zoomed in, unfortunately, but that's a hand pump. You know, so I've got to open a canopy to get to that hand pump. What if that machine is right next to a wall? What if it's blocked by material or, or, or other things? I've got to lift that handle up to actually engage the power, the hydraulic power to lower it down. So again, you've got issues there insofar as being able to pump that pump that machine down potentially. So what happens when we go higher? Um, I suppose it's a cliche to think that when machines are developed um, and we, you know, we go over this 180 foot, 185 foot, things just get bigger and heavier. Uh, and to be fair, they tend to do. They tend to, but no, that's not always the case. Um, some machines rely more heavily on stability systems and computers to keep them stable. Um, what you've got to appreciate from a rental and delivery, and, and certainly from a purchase consideration point, and the factor is that it's got to be a certain weight, um, and the weight, the gross weight of the machine, has got to be considered for things like delivery, point loading. Otherwise, you, we can't take it on the on the on the roads. Uh, it'll need a you know um, it'll need a, a movement escort everywhere we go. Um, so just without going too much on it, um, this is the um, computer screen, and you heard me right, computer screen in a JLG 150 foot boom. You can see there. Um, hopefully, um, you can see various things that have got the red line crossed through it. It means you can't use them controls. It's telling you you can only use a certain type of controls. Um, you can see on the bottom there. It's got its padlock. It's I'm in tortoise. Um, you, you can see on the right hand side I've got my little foot switch so it's telling me I'm going to have to take my foot off it so these are, you know, some of these are complicated pieces of equipment these days um, when we move on to boom control systems you can see the picture on the right hand side um, we have what's called an outreach limitation system and also um, envelope control um, and you can see on the bottom there, uh, sorry on the left hand side there you can see um, you know, some light horseshoes with green and yellow um, indicated uh, points and I'll cover that in a second but on the right hand side you've got this envelope control so you can see on the bottom there it's what we call a sawtooth envelope um, so you can lift up then you can telly out then you can lift up then you can telly out etc etc yeah so it looks a lot like a sawtooth but on the top you can see there we've got this ability to go anywhere um, now that's what um, that white one is what we would call envelope control um, and these are un it can be unnerving when you're operating this um, for example when you're booming in or um, or when lowering or telescoping out when lifting um, it can actually start to, to lower you know to, to lift or to lower on its own on the other section so if you are if you are booming if you are telescoping out it might start lifting the boom up okay if you're at full height and you're starting to telly in it might start lowering the boom down um, and to certainly to the uninitiated it can be quite unnerving uh, in my experience for um, it often results in operators often wrongly reporting this as an autonomous movement so in other words the machine moved on its own it's doing that because it's keeping it within its own envelope control um, the boom capacity indicator the blue the uh, the the, uh, the green and the yellows um, these are uh, the, it's an indicator and the yellow and green um, uh, and the green and white decal under is actually seen under the boom now in the platform you will change the capacity so for example you might change the capacity from 250 kilograms to 450 kilograms you're quite capable of doing that all right provided it's within the confines of the machine but if you fail to change that capacity and you're expecting it to take two people three people whatever you've got in the platform to go up to full reach and then it doesn't do that and most importantly you tend to blame the machine when actually it may have been your inability to swap to change over the chain um, to change over the capacity indicator and again it's knowing your machine um, I've, there are some machines where you can lift up and telescope out but then you can't rotate the jib again it's about this so the, when we get higher uh, when we get bigger when we get you know wider you know, these are some of the, the the concept of certainly just on a mobile boom I'm, I'm explaining here where we can have certain things that we need to be aware of 
So before we operate the machine, we need to know the controls, and this is all about familiarization. Um, you're going to check the area is clear before we operate it. You know, have a look at what each control does. Do they move slow, smoothly, steady? You know, when you let go of the control, does it stop? Now that I've let, I've put that in there because I'm being a bit of a monkey there by put when you let go of the control, does it stop? Often they will not stop immediately, and what that stop means is it, it's going to continue moving until it's stopped its hydraulic movement, and that's what we refer to as hydraulic ramping. So this is ramping up and ramping down. So for example, when I set when I drive on a machine and I drive forward, it may not immediately go straight away. If it did, it'd probably throw me around the platform. All right? But when I then lift up and lower down, you might find then that the um, um, you know the speed is going to slow down, but then not physically stop. Driving forward up to a wall, expecting it to stop, and I stop the controller, and it doesn't stop. It it, it rolls on forward just one, two, three feet. Um, it's built into the machine to slow the machine down mechanically or you know electrically, so it's not a fault with the machine. Tilt alarms. Now you earlier mentioned earlier we talked about sort of um, um, stabilising leveling. Tilt alarms are generally fitted to mupes, um, fitted to the chassis or the turret to the mupe. Um, it's fitted and checked while it's been thoroughly examined, and, and obviously PDI, and obviously it's fitted by the manufacturer. They will work up to a certain degree. Okay, over that degree, she's going to stop the machine from lifting. When we talk about level sensors, level sensors are often fitted to a truck or a track-mounted machine um, because the chassis can be moved quite, you know, into certain configurations. And often you'll find it's backed up with some type of spirit level bubble. So as a final check before we lift up, you can check the spirit level bubble, and it's got to be within a certain degree as identified on the, on the, on the. Um, you know, in, in the specifications. Um, we then have things like elevated drive speed. When I lift up in the air, all right, she will slow drive. That is actually a physical type of limit switch. Um, stability systems, stability systems to keep the machine stable. Audio and visual warnings. So audio warnings, when I'm moving, I may have a sounding beeper. Uh, when I'm lowering down, you know, I may have a horn. I can beep and get people out of the way. Um, and of course, emergency lowering systems. Countless types of emergency lowering systems. Um, you need to make sure that you know your people understand the different types. Okay, uh, things to make life easier. So we may have your typical 110 power to the platform. So we'll be able to get power from the platform um, via a normal 110 volt cable. You know, so we plug a transformer into the you know into the wall, plug our lead into the into the transformer, into the bottom control there on the left hand side, and then in the platform, I can then use 110 um, power. Uh, from the platform. All right. The disadvantage there is I've got a trailing lead. I can't move the machine too far because I might rip it off the wall or, or you know damage the, the damage it. The other option is then to use an inverter. Um, and again, these could be fitted to the machine. An inverter converts DC power to AC power, and this will allow a permanent flow of 110 volt power through the plug. So still the top right hand plug, um, and allows the operator to um, you know to have a constant stream of power. Um, without any trailing cables. The power source is active at all times. So I've got no trailing cables and I just drive away. And then generator. Um, many diesel mupes come with an onboard generator, removing the health and safety risk of a cable being scattered across the work floor and the need to hire a separate generator. It can be switched on, off, isolated from the control panel in the platform as and when required. Okay. All right. When we look at material handling devices, um, there are an array of material handling devices out there now for booms and scissors, for holding cladding, panels, um, you know, pipework, etc. We've got quite a lot of these in our in our in our fleet. Okay, and again, it's about asking for them instead of just tying something to the you know the guard rails and hoping for the best. Um, we will never um, use anything that's not been approved by the manufacturer. So from a it, Whatever material handling device you use, it must be compatible with the MUP. It's got to be CE approved. I have seen and heard of people uh, designing their own type of handling devices. Um, you do that, you take on the manufacturer's responsibility. Um, and need us any more than when it comes down to legal aspects, uh, because the manufacturer will walk away from you should the machine have a, a, a you know an overturn. So before we eleva elevate any machine, uh, we need to make sure that somebody can get us back down. Um, Emergency lowering and ground control panel is always got to be accessible. So in other words, not blocked next to a wall or a structure. Um, now, people always really shout about emergency lowering. You've got to have an emergency lowering plan. Great, you've got to have an emergency lowering plan. It's got to be documented and people have got to know how to you know, activate it and what to do in the, event of, in the event of an emergency. But your emergency lowering, as we know it on a machine, like the middle picture there where the guy's reaching in for the valve, is your last resort. 
Should the proverbial hit the fan, we turn the key from platform controls to ground controls and we bring the machine down using the ground controls. It's a hell of a lot faster than starting to hand pump a machine down. Okay, um, so things, examples of where, um, you know, for example, where emergency lowering may be needed, you know, your platform, um, you know, it's got snagged on something, it's faulty. Um, the operator may have, you know, engaged the e-stop, which stops you from operating the machine upstairs. Um, and maybe even the operator is incapacitated. The only thing then you can do is actually revert to the um, emergency lowering. Now the picture on the on the top there is the picture that IPAFT is devised um, for the universal symbol for the location of the emergency lowering. So always got to make sure the ground key is available. The last thing you want is the operator taking the key up in the platform because that prevents you then from turning the key from ground from from platform to ground. You've got to make sure that a ground rescue person has been appointed, whether known as a MOOP standby person, emergency rescue, doesn't matter, but I would always make sure that, that person knows how to bring that machine down in the event of an accident, whatever machine it is. Um, the person, the platform, how are they going to raise the alarm? They may not be in a position to raise the alarm. If they become incapacitated quickly, you know, you know, basically they're not gonna have that chance. What is the method of rescue? Is it gonna be using the ground controls, using the emergency controls, it's going to be basket to basket rescue. Who's going to carry out the rescue? And of course we need to practice. Um, you know, should something go wrong, there's nothing, you know, you, you never want to say that we didn't know what to do. That picture I've seen for years and no disrespect to our friends uh, in France who lot, great machine, um, fantastic piece of kit. Um, I love pictures that identify bad practice. These cladders are working by the side of the wall uh, and I know that machine very well. Um, the ground controls is actually on the wall side. So this is done for a marketing, I accept that. The emergency lowering is at the front of the machine. So effectively directly under, underneath where the guy is standing. So God forbid something goes wrong, I could pull the emergency lowering handle and that machine will dis, uh, descend. Um, controlled, it won't be, you know, it won't come down like you see um, James Bond in Casino Royal come down at, you know, full speed. Um, but what you will see is that if I cannot get to that um, ground control, because there may be a pallet of material there, um, or he may have extended that slide out deck over some other obstruction, we are in serious problems. All right, so we've got to always have another plan in place. IPATH, um, in, back in 2005, I think it was 2005, came up with a clunk click campaign um, and for boom type platforms uh, recommended that when, when in a boom type platform that a full body harness, harness with an adjustable lanyard is used to provide sh uh, work restraint. The lanyard should be adjusted to be as short as possible and may contain an energy absorbing device. In vertical lifts, it's not normally necessary for personnel working from a vertical lift to wear for protection, other than in exceptional circumstances. There are times in a boom type platform where you would not wear a harness working over water. Okay, um, again, it depends on the depth of the water, but you know, your dockside or working over a canal, the last thing you want to do is go to the bottom of the canal tied onto the machine. Falls from height and falls from the platform is the biggest um, killer um, in, in, in MUPS, okay, um, or one of the biggest killers in MUPS. Um, and evidence suggests that the biggest risk is by, from using a boom type MUP. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of this, it's the dynamic load. Um, so biggest risk is boom types, for example, tip overs from the ground, you know, driving off a curb, tipped against something, potentially impacted against another vehicle or from another vehicle. We've snagged the platform on something. Um, and the dynamics of a machine stability is effectively the whip effect. The inertia created by trying to free a snagged machine and then suddenly it then going free can have a catapulting effect. So that's, that's why we recommend a fall protection in a boom type mube. The guidance also mentions guidance of people working in the agricultural industry because of course we you know we, we we take a branch off a tree suddenly it catapult you know it falls to the ground but it hits the boom on the way down and unfortunately that's been the cause of quite a few fatalities in the agricultural industry of course if we're going to work over water not using a a, a harness and lanyard we then have to have a look, another type of thing looking for some type of life jacket so set up a movement um, you know, clearly we're going to have to look at ground conditions. MUPE should only be travelled across firm level surfaces capable of supporting the machine. From a gradient perspective, when travelling down a slope, 
We've got to do it slowly at 90 degrees to the slope where possible and apply the brakes regularly, ensuring the machine does not pick up that momentum. We've got to check the machine's gradeability prior to traveling up or down a, a slope too. From a traveling position, we've got to con check the controls against the machine's direction of travel. So we'd always look back and make, you know, on a boom type example, there's a good example that is, you know, I've, I've rotated the turret 180 degrees round. Okay, I'm actually going to be, you know, driving forward but going backwards. So we've got to make sure we are orientated the correct way. We've got to ensure that the outriggers or stabilizers are fully retracted. Again, unless stipulated by the manufacturer. Some track machines, it's actually safer to put your uh, your outriggers down um, close to the ground. So God forbid you start to tip, your outriggers are out, and that's going to prevent you from from uh, from tipping the machine over. Some machines require the boom to be stowed before travel, uh, and also a check that you know certain um, you know certain things are out the way. In other words, if we start to go up a hill, we might find that we'll ground the basket on the ground um, or, or slope. Situational awareness, you know, looking around you, ensuring that we're not going to get anything tied or caught, warning people, and of course, you know, warning devices. If the slope sensor is activated when elevated, action should be taken to lower the device immediately, uh, lower the machine immediately. So if your tilt alarm goes when you're up in the air, you need to know which way to bring the machine down. Do you lower the main boom or do you telly in? Depends on whether your basket is up or down. And again, looking at the operator's manual, uh, we'll, we'll give you that information uh, and, and check in travel speed you know you've got to make sure it's functional avoid traveling at high speeds um, you know reduce speed and sound horn near doorways and, and things like that don't leave the controls until the machine comes to a complete stop remember we talked about ramping down hydraulic ramp down uh, and then shutting down the machine to prevent unintentional movement uh, or you know unauthorized people so there's lots of things that we need to consider pick this one up off youtube it's quite a good little film um, and you can see it working now Hopefully, you forgive the language on this one. I don't think he does anything that's um, too swear wordy. But you can see the JLG, uh, what the person was thinking. You can see the trees on the on there. He's actually just hit the tree. So you know why he's even considered that. He's lowered the boom. The fact that his mate's video in it is, uh, yeah. Instead of telling him to stop, I have no idea why. Now, so he's reversing down. You can see the front wheels are turning. Some of you might have seen this on, on YouTube in the past. Um, as the slopes go in, that machine's probably around about sort of 14, 15 time, uh, 14, 15 tons. Um, at some point now, he's going to get, he's just shouted, you're going to fall. It's, he can't hear him. Um, and he's just telling him, it's over, it's over. It's in the hole, as he says. And there he goes. He's going to have a bad day. If he survives it, I don't know the outcome of that. Um, if if he didn't survive it, and um, yeah, um, apologies. Thankfully, we don't see anything. But you can also see it starts it catches fire as well. So there's you know you got to think about these things. And when we look at um, gradeability, gradients are usually expressed in percentages, and angles are normally expressed in degrees. So mupes are rated for their ability to ascend a slope. The highest grade a machine can climb up a slope while maintaining a particular speed is sometimes referred to as that machine's gradeability. So for most MUPEs, um, they show the gradient capability of the MUPE in its percentage. So for example, 40 degrees. Um, so, but as you can see from the chart, this is an angle of just over half of this figure in degrees. So for, for 40, uh, 40 degrees, you're talking nearly one and two, uh, 26, 26, 20, you know, 25 degrees. So, so we should never confuse percentage slope with degrees. And there is an easy way to work out the gradient, okay? Um, r rise divided by the run times by 100. But it does involve you having a, you know, a tape measure, uh, a straight edge, etc. Um, it should be very, very careful on slopes. So when we're going to set up, we need to explain the, the necessary things you're going to put ground, you know, you've, we've taken all the ground conditions into place. We need to ensure we've got barriers, um, where our working envelopes going to go, what our stability systems are like, ensure the MUP is level and, and make sure it doesn't clash with, with other work. You can see this great picture there of how not to do it. Um, certainly um, you wouldn't get that from, from our uh, our company, Wilson Access. You know, we'd expect the whole, you know, part or whole of the road closed. We'd have a machine that doesn't have the ability. Uh, it's quite an old machine that um, you can see you've got the ability there to actually descend into the traffic. A lot of them now, uh, you know, go the opposite way insofar as that you won't get, you'll get zero, um, zero rotation over over another lane. But again, a good example of, of how not to do it. 
Um, spreader plates then, we're going to set spreader plates down. They've got to be set on firm level ground. Um, the foot must be centered on the spreader plate, um, as you would expect. And one thing that I've been working on with the UK Country Council, I've been the sub-chair of the new guidance that's been uh, written for um, you know, um, ground conditions. Um, and there's going to be a new ready reckoner for all weights and, and point loads. Um, and hopefully, I say hopefully, we're not far away, um, we're going to have some common units available. So helping the planners there so they don't have God knows how many different types of, um, you know, force, power, uh, pr pressure, kilonewtons, um, you know, centimetre squared, centimetre cubed. Um, so again, without trying to be, con you know, condescending, some of them, they're, they're the easy things to sort of look at. That picture on the left is a great picture, um, but I don't know if you can see it particularly well. It's actually a mube that's on trackway. Um, instead of trying to bog the machine or, or cause issues, they've, they've laid trackway down. Um, so, you know, we would never expect an outrigger pad to be under a wheel like so. And again, if you are expecting that mute to get into that position, you've got to be able to give it the ground uh, to go into there properly. Um, when we're going to set up um, a machine, we just need to explain. Sometimes you'll get a decal on the side of the wheel, and that will that will identify the, the greatest... Um, weight that's going to be potentially on that wheel. Now, if I lift that machine up now and rotate it over one of these wheels, I might get something like 10,000 kilos. Um, and that, that weight in itself uh, means that, that that's what the point load is going through that, that wheel. So 80% of a wheel may, or may be over a single wheel or an outrigger. So it doesn't mean that there's always 10,000 kilograms on each wheel because it stands to reason. If I come directly 90 degrees between the two bottom wheels, there's going to be less weight on the opposite wheels. It's about balancing it out. So ground bearing pressure is important. Point loads um, and, and ground information can be supplied by the rental company. If we're going to expect people to work outdoors, wet, cold, etc., we need to keep them warm and dry. So we need to prepare to support people in the appropriate weather. Not only can we get seriously cold, fatigue, mental stress uh, do play a part when people are subjected to poor weather. Um, equally, in hot climates, pe people can find them struggling with the climate. So we need to consider about cooling them. Machines in different types of weather can also act differently. Um, thankfully, we don't get the bottom picture too often. Although it won't be a few, it won't be long until we probably got it. But you know what's going to happen? It won't start. It's trouble starting. It, you know, parts of the machine can freeze. If we've got an electric machine. Um, you know, the charge time on batteries is going to take a lot longer. And equally then, the runtime of batteries is going to be a lot shorter. Some machines are zero wind rated. This means that we should not, you know, without trying to explain the obvious, it means it shouldn't be used outdoors. Um, it should be used indoors only. Now, when, you know, when I find out a machine, okay, I find or identify a machine, I need to make sure that, you know, I've, I've taken into account if it is zero wind rated. How am I going to check the, the wind speed? Um, I can use an anemometer, um, and that anemometer can give me a, an indication of the wind. Some machines have fixed anemometers, um, or sometimes it's handheld, what we class as a bit of PPE. Manual, the decal, and the data plate are going to give that, and it's going to be measured at working height. Um, so when I get to 50 foot, I take my anemometer out and measure it. Clearly, I would have measured it before I elevated. Operation um, in between corners, roof lines. I've got to be careful of gusty wind or you know sheeting, and effectively the wind chill. You know, so the effects on on the extremities of the body um, can be can be quite important. Come wind funneling down that uh, alleyway there could be absolutely you know twice, three times what it would be out in an open area. So just be be mindful. It can actually also be less. It can be almost like two two mile an hour, in, or it could be 25, 30, 40 miles miles an hour. Secondary guarding, um, obviously there's an increased risk when you're driving or lifting near any overhead obstructions, so we've got to maintain all-round observation. And we also remember taking into account the ramping up and the ramping down on the machine. You can see some, some uh, examples there of um, you know, secondary guarding devices that are out there on the market. Again, I've done a webinar of that on the past, so if you want a little bit more information on that, feel free to download it. Um, you know, and you know, what we're trying to do is prevent crushing. Um, been in this game too long and a lot of people really look at the controls without really sort of spatially being aware of what's behind them um, and in a situation like that now he's been caught by the machine he's obviously self-asphyxiated um, the guy's in trouble you've got to have a rescue plan to get that person down so without thinking you know hopefully i'm not trying to to to, uh, to frighten you at all you know machines they are safe by design but to comply with the design standards they've got to have things you know they shouldn't be able to start unexpectedly 
The machine must be designed or protected in such a way that the desired effect, that where a hazard is involved, it can only be achieved by a deliberate action. So a hold to run device, enable, a foot enable switch, a button. This is what we know as a function enable device. Um, and these are, these are um, you know, sometimes either recessed or a button or a trigger. Um, these are effectively what we also know as primary guarding systems. And these are the primary source of operator protection. So they should never be negated, never be, you know, uh, people mess around with them. If work to be conducted where the MUP is high risk, then clearly, you know, we are looking, you know, working close to an, an extra potentially crushing area or high risk area, then we need to consider, you know, secondary guarding systems. Um, certainly in some industries, second guarding, secondary guarding has been mandated, but we also need to consider uh, potentially looking at PAL plus. Second, and I'll explain PAL plus in a second. Secondary guarding systems, okay, it's been muted quite a lot now, no single device prevents all known issues. Indeed, many are only activated once the body has been forced against the sensor. So, you know, and that's come straight from the IPATH guidance. You can download that document, get an idea of what you want. Um, in my view, prevention is better than the cure. However, there are some very good devices out there now, uh, and I'd, you know, I'd be uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look at the different types. PAL Plus, um, this is an optional course. So once a person has passed a, an IPATH operator's course, they then can do the PAL Plus. And it's optional, additional, it's category-specific training aimed at operators working in higher risk or more challenging environments. So as you can see there, it's a bit of a compact theory session. We're going to get you out on the machines a lot more quicker. And people who do the PAL Plus will get the plus after their um, you know, designated machines. So 3A plus, 3B plus. The, we do have, a it has got a challenging practical exercise, um, and there's also written and practical tests, and also individual attitudes, uh, individual interviews, because it's about attitude, it's about behavior, it's about looking at what they would do in certain situations. Uh, but you've got to have the PAL plus in date to actually, uh, sorry, you've got to have the PAL in date to do the PAL plus. And of course, when we're looking at parking the machine, we want to make sure that we park on firm level ground. We should fully lower the platform. The machine should be isolated against unauthorized use. We would always expect the emergency stops to be in. Some machines have three, four, so make sure they're all in. We should turn the key to off and we should remove it. And where possible, if we can, we electrically isolate the machine. Don't forget the operator, operator may be held responsible if someone is hurt during unauthorized use. As if an operator is hurt, you as managers and supervisors and, and ultimately the, the, the employer are going to take that responsibility. When we're fueling the machine, the engine should be off. Um, obviously, we need to take into account any f spillage um, and make sure that we have sort of um, cleanup procedures and disposal so we can contain you know, fuel so it doesn't get down drains, etc. Um, and um, when we're battery charging, instructions must be followed. Electric machines should be charged in a well-ventilated area. Remember, the gas that's produced is hydrogen. Um, and obviously, you know, contact with fuel or battery acid may uh, require some sort of medical attention. When we're charging, um, again, making sure it's secure um, and making sure that we, um, you know, make sure that we have the power off. Um, and in some respects, we may have to block the machine to prevent it from um, from moving. Um, there are different solutions for isolating. I mentioned earlier about the uh, the card reader system. Uh, I me and a colleague control all our um, devices that we have, and literally, I can turn your machine off with the touch of a mobile phone, um, which is quite um, quite onerous. Um, but easily, you know, if you've if you've finished your job at the end, of, you know, and you've finished, and your 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 um, contract, your 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 staff are off site, you can easily just you know isolate all your machines very very quickly. Okay, then. So summarise. Then we've gone through legislation and guidance. Um, we must train people before. Uh, operating a MUP, and it's your employer's responsibility to ensure that all operators using equipment are adequately trained and familiarised. MUP surveys need to be carried out. Use the, you know, use the services of your rental company. Get some of your people on a MUP and managers course so they understand the, you know, the, what's responsibility when we hire a MUP. Check your selection criteria before using the hiring a MUP. Where am I going? What's the, what's the intended task? Have I got multiple tasks? Make sure that you have a six monthly thorough examination. Um, before you elevate, check operation of all ground controls. So making sure all the ground controls work. We need to make sure that all the platform controls work. Um, make sure that we have in place a rescue plan and a rescue sequence have been put in place. Um, check the route. Walk the route. Go and check and make sure it's all okay. 
um, and make sure that you've got ability to do that. Consider the weather. We know in the UK it's going to change. It invariably does. And ensure that you have a secure parking area. Okay, I mentioned earlier we've got a QA. We haven't got long because I am conscious of actually run over slightly. A um, lot of information to take in. We've also got, um, so you understand, of all, our, all the machines in the AFI fleet, um, that's on the mute rental side, we have now familiarization and emergency lowering videos. They're all available on, on uh, our AFI website uh, and also on YouTube. These are freely available. They're not charged. Um, it's me that does all the um, all the familiarization videos. Um, they're all, um, you know, all been all been highly highly uh, used in the, in the industry. So feel free to uh, to use these. And you know, if you've got any feedback, appreciate that. Okay. Um, so questions. I've um, got a rake of questions here. I'm not sure I'm going to get through them all. Um, Alana, when hiring a MU, how do we ensure we are compliant with the law? Well, hopefully I've covered a lot of that. I mean, clearly from a management point of view. Um, you're going to have to be aware of your health and safety responsibilities. You're going to have to have done hazard identification, spotting, making sure PPE is available, and we clearly want to prevent accidents. You've got to be aware of all the guidance and the best practice that's out there um, and the maintenance requirements and, and se select the machine. One thing I didn't mention, I didn't mention, I I'll briefly touched on it earlier, is, is your terms and conditions. Depending upon what terms and conditions you sign up to depends on your res responsibilities for when you've hired the machine. So you need to be very, very mindful of what t's and c's you've actually signed up to it's and again from a from a operator point of view and a management point of view it's about mitigating your risk when using the machines has he done his pre-use inspections has he done his function checks from the ground has he done the function checks from the platform from a management point of view have you got somebody there in place to do a, a rescue a, a rescue should something go wrong and hopefully they're uh, you know they're easy enough things for you um um to get to get through um so I'm just looking through some there. Do you have any generic, gen, generic specific risk assessments for MUPS? That's from Tom. There is a, on the IPATH website, there is a generic risk um, rescue plan for MUPS, albeit it is not, um, it, 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 well, it, is, it is what it is, it's generic. You can you download that and then you can put the machines in there that you've done. Right, I've got a question here from Tom. If the health and safety manager completes a risk assessment and are working at height permit, what must the operator be obliged to do apart from the obvious? Clearly, the operator's got the responsibility to carry out the pre-use checks and function checks. He's got to use the MUP as indicated by the, um, the manufacturer's handbook, um, report accidents, defects, use the machine. He's got to follow what you've told him. So if it's a boom type machine, you should be ensuring that you're wearing a harness. He should be ensuring he's wearing a harness. Um, reporting faults, um, you know, any any defects to the machine, um, ensuring the machine is set up correctly before before it lifts. But from a management point of view, you've got to make sure that you've given him the um, you know the right type of ground to set that machine up. I'm just trying to go through these questions. Right. Um, that's a well, you can't see. They give you the smallest window ever to read the questions. It's quite funny. Thanks for informative presentation, from Kevin. Can you confirm the minimum training requirements for a PAV? Uh, minimum re training requirements from a PAV. So you can do a half-day PAV, power, push around vertical. Remember the machine that said that you can push? You can do a PAV half-day course. Failing that, um, people who have done the mobile vertical 3A course do not need to do the PAV course. Um, provided they have had familiarization and it's been documented, then they can use a PAV. The one thing I will say about smart cars, um, and I was at a convention last week in Vienna, is th there is talk of these smart cars becoming, with an iPath app, being an electronic um, logbook. So you know, basically on your on on the, on my pal my pal card, I'll be able to build up a history of the machines that I've used by you know scanning something on the machine or you know with my eye you know it's all going to work with your smartphone i think 90 90 percent of the world these days have, have smartphones and they're getting smarter um so i, I would say that um i've got a question there for me in views on self-rescue from a mute using rope access and abseil techniques when total failure of the machine <sighs> stay in the machine if it's totally failed you've i mean uh, most most mobile mupes 
uh, their harness points are identified as restraint uh, and normally maximum three kilonewton um, um, maximum on the on the uh, on the anchorage, an, an, anchorage point. You start to use that as a descending anchor, then unfortunately um, there's a very good chance that that will not hold. There are some bigger truck mounts um, where you can um, use use that type of uh, device to descend, um, but again that will be done with um, you know the manufacturers and also with the um, you know with, with um, any any guidance. Um, somebody just said there I've got. Um, yeah, he's gone. Um, okay, I think I've answered all your questions. Of course, if you've got any other questions afterwards uh, and you feel like you don't want to mention them here, I'm more than happy to take questions afterwards. Um, hopefully you found this informative today. As I say, um, in, a, in a day or two, you'll find there'll be a recording of this. Um, but feel free, if you if you wish to, to, uh, to send an email via questions. Uh, and I'll tend to try and get them answered by the end of this week. Okay. Thank you very much for listening today. Have a great day. Bye.